Hello, my name is Ethan Rittenauer. I am an educator for um, the uh, Artesian Alliance, which is the Chiha Parking Zoo, the Flint River Aquarium, and the Thronatiska Heritage Center here in Albany, Georgia. Um, today I'm coming to you from uh, the Chiha Parking Zoo, and I'm going to talk about um, a growing problem. And it's one that uh, we've been trying to solve for years now and has been building and building and building. And uh, we're gonna take a closer look at it. And that issue is um, invasive species. So I'm going to share a PowerPoint with you here. Um, so invasive species, um, whenever I say invasive species, I'm not talking exclude, invasive species are non-native organisms. So they can be plants, animals, fungi, disease, um, pretty much anything that's living. They are non-native and they are harmful. So um, there are um, a lot of examples of non-native organisms that aren't necessarily harmful. Like maybe we don't mind them as much or, or they just kind of stay where they are or even on a few rare occasions, they actually help um, the ecosystems that they um, are found in. So a couple of examples of um, non-native but not necessarily harmful um, uh, organisms are things like pill bugs, roly polies. Um, they're actually not native, they're um, native to Europe. Um, but whenever they ended up over here, um, they actually filled um, an ecological niche that hadn't really been filled yet. Um, they, um, and so they, uh, they sort of just found their own, they carved their own little path and they didn't really hurt any other creatures by doing so, at least not that we know of. And um, um, now they're found everywhere um, and they're really fun and we like them. Um, grass, this is an example of a non-native, but um, depending on where you are, not harmful. Um, like we have grass in, in our yards here, but grass, believe it or not, or at least the type of short grass that we use is not native to um, the United States or North America at all. Um, North America had several kinds of grasses that were very tall reed-like grasses um, before European settlers came, um, but all of these grasses are actually originally European. Um, other things like dandelions and uh, and uh, there's another plant that's very similar to a dandelion that's called a plantain, but it's not like the banana plantain. It's just a different kind of plantain. Um, those those are non-native, but not necessarily harmful. In fact, the dandelion was brought over um, as a crop. Um, people used to farm dandelions, but they just spread everywhere. Um, and so even after we've stopped really farming them a whole lot, they're just everywhere now. Um, and then another um, example that might surprise you is the peach tree. Um, Georgia's peaches that it's famous for are not native. Um, they actually, um, peaches were introduced to Georgia whenever um, uh, Spanish uh, conquistadors showed up and started trading with um, Central American natives. And um, one of the things that they traded was the peach. And in over the course of the next 50 years or so, the peach just kind of spread like wildfire up into the north. Um, so peach trees, not actually native, but we don't really consider them invasives. Um, another example of things um, that aren't invasives are things that um, have grown to become harmful that are actually native. Um, so um, this is usually not normally the case, like these, these examples of things um, might be, um, they're, they're from the area originally or, um, but usually in much smaller quant quantities or their impact wasn't as big, but because of other environmental changes, they're now suddenly much more, um, problematic. So, uh, an example, um, that I have is, uh, the white-tailed deer, um, white-tailed deer populations have exploded in the last hundred years because of the decline of any predators like wolves or mountain lions or, or even um, a lot of bears don't go after white-tailed deer anymore because they can just find food in other places now um, because of human intervention. Um, so white-tailed deer populations have exploded and it's actually caused a whole lot of other problems because if white-tailed deer, if there's a lot of white-tailed deer, they're going to eat a lot of plants 
And so now the plants are getting um, grazed completely. Um, and so they're dying off and, and it's just causing all kinds of like a positive feedback loop of bad um, because the white-tailed deer population is exploding all because our ecosystem has changed due to human impact. Another example of this is poison ivy. As weather gets um, uh, warmer and warmer, um, poison ivy has a harder and harder time uh, or has an easier and easier time uh, surviving through the winters and uh, spreading um, earlier in the season and earlier in the season and it's starting to choke out all of the other competing vines. And so now that's a huge problem. Um, deer ticks, um, mosquitoes, wasps, these are all examples of bugs um, that normally would not be able to survive the winters or, or very few of them would be able to survive the winters. But because we're getting milder and milder winters in the north, um, their, their populations are just exploding as well. So sometimes there are native species that can be harmful um, due to environmental changes. Um, but if you put them together, being non-native and harmful, that's what I mean whenever I'm describing an invasive species. You might also hear them called alien species sometimes, um, and it's for the same reasons. It's because they're not from around and they um, adversely affect our ecosystem. So they're very um, harmful to us. Um, so how are invasives um, introduced? Um, how do they get here? If they're not native and they hurt us, then, then how do they get here? Well, it's usually one of three ways. Um, they um, spread due to environmental changes. So um, sometimes an organism might not be able to survive in a region, but now that the environment has changed, they're able to. Um, they um, hitch rides. So um, they might uh, come down like, like humans might carry them accidentally to a new region and now they're thriving. If you're hearing any background noise, it's because I have an animal example for you um, that we're gonna, we're gonna get to here in just a moment. And then the other reason why invasives are sometimes introduced is because they are purposely introduced by humans. So sometimes, and I know this sounds a little bit crazy, Sometimes we put them there on purpose. It's not an accident. We just put them in their new ecosystem and then they cause all kinds of damage. Um, so um, let's talk about the first one that I mentioned here, environmental changes. In general, um, we have had warmer winters and hotter summers annually. Um, uh, there are a few exceptions to this, like every once in a while we'll have a particularly cold winter or a particularly um, chilly summer. Um, but in general, the average global temperature is just going up pretty steadily. Um, and some organisms that thrive in warmer weather are able to survive in further north places. So um, like for instance, here in Georgia, we're getting several tropical species um, that are slowly making their way up and, um, and starting to uh, compete with our native species um, out here in um, the wild. Um, uh, in the north, um, you get a lot of creatures that normally wouldn't be able to last um, through the winter that are now suddenly able to last in the winter. Um, it's, a, it's a really big problem. Um, some examples of this are things like Africanized honeybees, which um, Africanized honeybees are kind of an interesting one because we made Africanized honeybees. We tried to, um, to create a hybrid between um, the European honeybee and the African honeybee um, because the African honeybee produced way more honey. So we thought if we could just breed them, the European honeybee would produce more honey. But we ended up, what we ended up accidentally doing was they did produce more honey, but they're also hyper aggressive. Um, and then we accidentally released them. Um, and so they're found in the tropics, but every single year, their range further and further north gets, gets a little bit more and a little bit more. Um, Another example of this is kudzu, which is a type of vine. Um, it's native to um, East Asia, places like Vietnam and Cambodia, um, but uh, it got introduced um, here in Georgia at one point and it just started to just spread like crazy. Um, um, and it's, it's, um, it wouldn't normally be able to survive in um, the kind of weather that we have because believe it or not, our winters are actually a little bit too um, dry for them. But um, 
because we've been getting wetter and wetter weather and warmer and warmer weather, they're able to survive a lot better. Um, the probably most common way that, uh, that invasive species are spread is through accidental trafficking. Um, so a lot of invasives are spread um, by uh, people accidentally carrying them over um, to a new location. Um, and it's actually very common. Um, uh, probably the most infamous example of this would be the Black Plague. Um, the bubonic plague um, was spread um, from, it, it originated in Asia, um, somewhere in Asia, we're not sure exactly where, um, and uh, it got spread over um, by uh, um, the Khans, actually. Um, Genghis Khan's like great, great grandson or somebody, I forget exactly who, um, took the bubonic plague and actually, um, whenever he was laying siege, to a um, fortress in Turkey, he fired um, his own men's dead bodies who had um, caught, who had gotten the plague over the wall, and that's how it spread to that city. And then it also spread um, across to um, the rest of Europe that way as well. Um, people, um, it would it would carry it would be carried on uh, rats, and rats would take it across um, to through ships um, to the, um, the rest of uh, Europe. And it killed about a third of the population of the entire world, which is absolutely wild. Um, another example of a disease um, that traveled is actually, um, let me see if I can say it, Pseudogymnoascus destructens. And the last, the, the species name destructens probably gives it away. It is an extremely destructive kind of fungus called white nose syndrome, white nose syndrome fungus. Um, uh, bats, especially the little brown bats, um, the fungus will grow in caves and it originally is from Europe um, where the bats are actually immune to it, but it made its way over to the United States um, because of farming equipment that got shipped over across the Atlantic. And whenever it got into caves here, it spread like crazy among the bats um, and the bats would get these white noses, which is why it was called white nose syndrome. And then they would just die. Um, and this actually killed um, somewhere around 99% of the entire bat population of um, the East Coast, which is insane. Um, we almost had a mass extinction of all bats. Um, fortunately, um, the bats are starting to make a slow but steady recovery. This was about 15 years ago now, um, they're starting to make a very slow recovery. Um, and we've noticed that nowadays they aren't bunching up together as much in caves. Um, um, and that's because it reduces the spread. It's kind of like how right now with COVID-19, people are trying to stand six feet apart from one another. Um, and uh, these bats are now all spaced out just a little bit more during hibernation. Um, another example of a um, hitchhiker invasive is tumbleweed. You might think tumbleweed, that's a, a classic of the American West, but it's actually Russian. Um, it is a Russian weed and it showed up sometime in the, um, in the mid to late 1800s and it just spread like wildfire because their entire, um, their entire deal is to just have all of their seeds in the plant and then just tumble away and they'll carry it somewhere new from the wind and just spread their seeds everywhere. Um, so tumbleweed took over the entire American uh, West by storm. Um, and zebra mussels are another example of, a, um, of an invasive that was accidentally trafficked around. Um, so zebra mussels are um, a specific kind of freshwater mussel that you will probably find in your streams um, because they have made their way to everywhere. Um, they are all over the place. Um, and the United States actually used to have a ton of freshwater mussels, but one of the, um, one of the main drivers of their extinction are things like zebra mussels taking over. Um, they um, are because a ship had some zebra mussels just attached onto the side of it, um, and made its way into the um, Great Lakes area, and then it just spread from there. Um, it's kind of crazy how quickly they spread. Um, some of these um, creatures. Um, 
And then the last, the last um, thing that happens is they get intentionally introduced. And this actually happens a surprising number of times. Um, it's really very disappointing. Um, a lot of it happened um, during the turn of the century, during the turn of the 20th century. So in the early 1900s, um, America was sort of in this um, time where they were trying to compete with European powers. And they thought, well, if I can have European animals um, and show them off, like in my gardens and stuff, it'd be great. So, um, for example, there are Barbary sheep um, in Texas now. Barbary sheep are an African sheep. Um, um, they were introduced um, after World War II. Um, some rich uh, uh, landowner decided he wanted to hunt Barbary sheep, but he didn't want to make his way all the way over to Africa to do it. So he put a bunch of Barbary sheep on his property and then they got loose and started a wild population in Texas. So Texas has African wild sheep roaming around. Another great example of this is the grass carp. The grass carp was actually introduced um, uh, into ponds because uh, they thought it was a fun fish to fish, um, which I don't really understand that because anybody who actually fishes would know that grass carp are kind of gross, kind of a gross creature. Um, they're these big carp. They're the ones that like, if you've ever tossed bread to carp in a lake, they're the ones that are, are coming up to eat it. Um, and along with grass carp actually came um, a couple different kinds of weed that they eat because they just pooped out this, the seeds and the seeds were, were fine. So they took root as well. Grass carp are especially vicious because the original plan was to just keep them in ponds, but it turns out grass carp can dig under the ground um, into the water table and swim around um, in soft earth um, until they can find themselves a new stream. So even if you have like a pond and then a river right there, and they're not connected, the grass carp can still make its way into the river because it will just dig through the ground, through the mud, which is kind of crazy. Um, a little closer to home um, in Florida, they're having a huge problem with Burmese pythons, which as the name suggests are not from around here, they're from Burma. Um, and uh, so they, um, these Burmese pythons are, um, they keep getting introduced because people keep getting Burmese pythons as pets. And then they don't know what to do with them because they, they didn't realize how to actually take care of a pet. So they just throw them into the wild. And instead of dying, these Burmese pythons are just out competing the um, snakes that already live there. Um, and then there is, of course, English ivy, which actually, as I was walking around for lunch today, I found some on a tree. English ivy, um, you might look at that and it looks a lot like greenbrier or catbrier. But um, the real dead giveaway is um, the um, way that the uh, leaf is shaped and then also the very woody stem. It actually, um, if you see um, these vines on trees, they look like uh, poison ivy vines. Um, they've got these really thick woody trunks with just tons of little spindles attached to them, um, grabbing hold of the um, tree. And what they do is they actually produce so much um, vine that it weighs the tree down um, and they um, outcompete all um, native vines um, to the United States. So English ivy is a pretty um, good example. Um, it was it was brought over because people thought it looked good in their gardens. People would like to hang it on trellises and, and build um, little archways that people walked through that had English ivy and they did not stop and think maybe just maybe this English ivy was going to spread around and hurt the ecosystem. Um, and then the last example that I have written on here is multiflora rose. Multiflora rose is a thorn bush. Um, it grows these little rose-like flowers that I think smell bad. Um, in fact, I don't like anything about multiflora rose, but believe it or not, um, a lot of states were encouraging people to plant multiflora rose near streets because um, if there was construction going on on a street, um, there would be more erosion, and they thought if they could plant these um, bushes, there would be less erosion, which is true, but then it just spread like crazy and, and took over everything else. Um, uh, somebody asked, um, are the pythons in Florida only a problem for other snakes? Aside from being a problem for other snakes, they're actually a, a problem for a whole lot of other things. You see, um, they eat the prey that other snakes eat, and so these other snakes are going to go hunt 
even more prey than, um, than might have already happened. So they completely upset the balance of the entire ecosystem. Um, the whole thing is, is over. And um, other animals, um, snakes oftentimes are not at the very top of the food chain. They actually will get eaten by other things like hawks and whatnot. But these Burmese pythons don't get eaten as much by other creatures as well. Um, so um, it's just this whole thing where they don't really have any natural predators in the wild. Um, and so they just eat and eat and eat and eat. Um, and it's, it's causing all sorts of problems. Um, so yeah, they hurt other snakes. They hurt pretty much everything that they interact with, they hurt in the ecosystem. Um, so actually I'm gonna skip ahead of here for just a moment. Um, let's talk about, um, actually I am gonna go back, I've changed my mind. Um, let's talk about combating invasive species. Um, how do we do it? How do we fight the spread of invasive species? So plants usually spread accidentally. People bring them um, on uh, vehicles, luggage, stuff like that. Um, in fact, firewood, firewood is a great example. If people bring firewood from say, let's say that I wanted to go up to the Great Smokies in North Carolina for the weekend and I took firewood from here all the way up there, that increases the risk of spread. So um, ways that we can fight it um, are things like don't take plants out of their native environment. So like I just said, don't take firewood somewhere else. Um, if you go somewhere and you wanna camp, just get the firewood that's there. Um, uh, plant native plants, anytime you do construction um, or, or you uproot a bunch of other plants. So like for instance, if uh, say you're putting a shed in your yard, you can uh, plant native plants around it um, and all of that dirt that you had to pick up to put the shed there, you can plant native plants and then because you've made the conscious choice to plant and take care of native plants instead, those invasives are gonna have a, have a harder time growing there. Um, also, unrooting and removing invasives um, as soon as they are spotted is usually a pretty good strategy. Um, the best defense is prevention, um, uh, but it's very difficult to fight um, native plants because um, they spread their seeds. A lot of them spread their seeds really rapidly because they're from areas where plant life is very competitive. And um, it's just becomes a huge issue. Like, like English ivy, for instance, grows pretty quickly. Uh, multiflora rose spreads their seeds around. Um, and actually, even if you uproot them, if you don't get every single part of the root, they're going to grow right back, which is a real problem. Um, so there's all kinds of stuff. Now, ways that we don't really wanna fight them, um, you can use things like herbicides, um, but, and they will be effective, but you need to think very um, hard about whether or not your herbicides are only hurting the invasives. So sometimes if you use the wrong kind of herbicide or you use way too much of it, or, or you use it very irresponsibly, um, you might kill just as many native plants as you do non-native ones. And then you're, at a sum negative instead of a sum positive. So um, now as far as animals go, animals spread accidentally, just like a lot of things. The example that I have is Norway rats. Um, um, and sometimes they are purposely brought in by humans as well. Um, and the um, ways that we can fight it are um, animal removal programs. So like wild hogs, for instance, um, wild pigs are not native um, and they are very invasive. Um, so ways that we are doing it is there are government programs where they pay people for removing wild boars. Um, sometimes this one's a little bit iffy, um, but it, it does happen here and there. Um, sometimes um, people suggest bringing in a new animal to combat the old animal, which to me always sounds like you're just going to introduce two invasives now instead of just one. Um, but they do that sometimes for an animal that might not necessarily have any natural predators. Sometimes um, they consider it a good idea to put one of their natural predators in, and then that predator will hunt this creature down. And the goal is hopefully they will put each other in check. They will balance each other out. But it seems pretty obvious um, what the challenges for that would be. Um, 
like maybe this animal doesn't actually um, eat the um, animal you're trying to combat and they'll just eat everything else instead. Or maybe it will also spread like wildfire or maybe it will be completely ineffective and that animal just won't be able to survive in the new ecosystem. Um, there are all kinds of challenges to that one, but sometimes it is a, a, a strategy that they use. And as I said a minute ago, the best way to combat invasive species is to simply try to prevent them as best as you can. Um, and actually I'm gonna talk about a success story um, on the prevention of invasive species. Um, Alberta, Alberta, Canada, this little province right over here has no rats. There are no rats in Alberta, Canada, or at least if there are, they get wiped out pretty quickly. Um, and it's because Alberta, um, hey, uh, we are back. That was a bit strange. Um, sorry about that. Um, it seems that Zoom was behaving badly. Um, but as I was saying, Let's get you back up here. As I was saying, Alberta has no rats. Um, they made a strong effort to try to keep rats out of Alberta for a, as best as they could. They actually take um, a certain amount of money every year and designate it as a sort of rat clearing fund, an extermination fund. Um, uh, the ways that they fought rats in the beginning were not the most ethical in the world. They would um, hunt them down with shotguns, um, poison, um, all kinds of stuff. And it actually adversely affected their ecosystem. It killed a lot of native animals. And, the, and um, But nowadays, they, they've sort of improved a lot more. They use very mild pesticides that um, shouldn't hurt things other than rats. Um, they uh, uh, continuously fight to keep rats from making their way into the province. And so to have a pet rat would be illegal. Um, and if you do have a rat infestation, there's actually a government program in place to fight them. And actually, um, I read that they use pretty much all of the money that they designate for it every single year because rat infestations are becoming a larger and larger issue. Um, and I'm actually going to um, show you guys the animal that I have now. Um, there we go. I'm going to show you guys the animal that I have now. Um, it's a mammal, um, and because of the current state of the world, um, I don't want to spread any germs or disease to this animal. Um, so I'm going to put on a mask and some gloves, and then I'm going to show you guys um, a pretty cool animal that is technically an invasive species, though we are taking pretty good care of it. Uh, this little dude is Bruce Banner, and he, uh-oh, can you, sorry guys, we seem to be having some technical difficulties, but hopefully they are behind us. This was the animal I wanted to show you. This is Bruce Banner. He is a Norway rat, um, and he's a cutie patootie. Um, he's kind of an old rat, um, but he is trying to sit down, I guess. There we go. Bruce Banner is a rat, and as I mentioned before, rats are an invasive species. If you see a rat in the wild, it's not supposed to be there. There are no rats native to um, the Americas. Um, uh, and they tend to infest themselves uh, around humans. Actually, rats um, grew up with humans. Um, they have um, adapted really well to living in human-centric areas. So things like sewers and the bottom of ships back in the day and inside of houses nowadays. Um, 
these guys also um, have historically spread a lot of disease around. As I mentioned before, there's the bubonic plague, which was spread by, I'm pretty sure, um, bugs on rats. Um, uh, they actually, believe it or not, um, mice, um, not rats, but mice, um, are the uh, uh, original um, spreaders of um, uh, Lyme disease. Um, what happens is ticks bite mice with Lyme disease, and then the ticks will bite humans with Lyme disease, or the ticks will bite humans, and they will spread the Lyme disease around. Um, so um, rats uh, can spread a lot of disease to humans because um, they're actually very genetically similar to humans. I know it doesn't seem like it. You're looking at this rat, and you look at one of us, and you're like, we don't look that similar at all, but um, they can um, spread disease around. And that's also actually why rats, he just wants to move around. That's actually also why rats, um, are often used as test subjects whenever we were trying to test things like vaccines. Like for instance, um, uh, a lot of the vaccines that, um, are coming out nowadays, um, were tested on mice and then maybe were tested on some kind of ape or primate. And then finally we're tested on humans and then they're released. Um, so they're actually very important to us um, for testing things out. Um, so um, this is this guy is invasive, but um, we're not that worried about it because he's separated. He's all by himself. Um, he does technically have a little friend in there um, where we put him, but um, not capable of breeding and therefore um, is not going to be a problem for future generations. Um, so you can say goodbye to Bruce now, because I'm going to put him back. And let's talk a little bit about, let's talk a little bit about um, what you can do about invasives. I've talked about combating invasives in general, but um, I think one of the greatest tools to combating invasives is to figure out um, more stuff about invasives. So I actually have, um, there are all kinds of government lists. Invasives are officially classified both at the federal and state level. Um, so you can look um, in your own state to see um, what's considered an invasive. Um, but there's this list from the US Department of Agriculture um, that um, it does it by region. Um, and it does it by state. Um, so like for instance, I'm in Georgia. So if I click on Georgia here, it will hopefully show me a whole bunch of Georgia resources. So um, here's a list of the um, top non-native invasive plants. And so it, um, it lists all of the non-invasive plants. It shows the acreage that they control right now. Um, you can see whether or not their populations are increasing or decreasing. So these ones are actually decreasing, which is great, but a few of them are increasing, which is not as good. In fact, ivy, um, English ivy, this plant that I just mentioned right here is increasing at a rate of 51% every year. And trifoliate orange, which was a new addition just, just 2019, has increased 153% in the last year, which is pretty crazy. Um, so you can actually look at these and um, do a little bit of research on your own and see what plants around you are native and non-native and figure out which ones are harmful. And then maybe you'll be able to fight it by uh, removing the plant from, uh, from the area or getting involved with a program that combats um, invasive species. A lot of parks, a lot of communities have programs in place to fight um, invasive, invasive species. Um, so that is all I have for you today. Um, I thank you for coming and I hope you have a good day.